if you put the big grid over the photo and the little grid on the piece of paper and do the same thing, what have you done? You reduced it. Okay? If you put the little grid over here and the big grid over here, what have you done? You enlarged it. Okay? All right. This is like a, uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you call those camera obscuras? You remember the old camera? You ever heard the term camera obscura? Mm -hmm. This is the camera obscura. That's all it is. Okay? Now, here we go. So, in your in your handout, there's a there's this little activity for you to do at home. Here's a grid. Here's the grid with the drawing on it, but the, the grid has been mixed up. So you simply match this number to this number and draw what's in the box. And all of the... This is this is to get you used to drawing lines, copying pieces. Okay, it's a very cool. Ex the next week you're going to tell me what this is. Okay. Okay. You're gonna have to, it, it, it's listed on there as part of your homework. Okay. Again, this is not a new technique. This was developed many, many, many. Van Gogh used it, Michelangelo used it. This gentleman used it. This is his original board. Any idea who he is? Audubon. He didn't use mylar, he used a piece of wood with lines thrown on it and long pieces of wire which he would put. And then he would look at the wire and the grid and that's how he, because he couldn't draw the shape with the crack. I mean, I read all the arguments. Once he had the shape right, he went to town. But getting the shape right was a, and you notice that some of his birds are kind of, I've never seen a heron in the position of his heron. <laughs> because he had them on these boards. You know, he had them, he shot them. That, you know, he wasn't doing anything from life. Here he is. Isn't he happy about these? You want to go to an interesting place? You should go to the John James Audubon Museum in, it's in Kentucky, across the river from Evansville. It's a wonderful place, but it shows you all of his techniques and, and so forth. And we don't, good news is we don't have to kill stuff anymore. So this technique works very, very well also. So, that's your introduction to sketch journaling, okay? Is that enough? Because next week when we go outside and we, we ask, we're going to, the whole thing is the application, we're going to ask you to, to do some of these things. So you need, not next week, in two weeks. It's about applying what you know Here's, a, here's, a, here's some uh, examples of, of sketch journals that you, I'd like you to look at during the break. We'll give you a little bit. Well, I, when I went, we, so I went to Africa a couple years ago, and to study for going to Africa, I'm a photographer. So how do you study? To, so I drew whatever I wanted to see. And the, page one and two were done with the, the grid and all these techniques I've told you by page three. It needed. And that's all it took. Two weeks, but that's all it took. And pretty soon you can do this. Don't think just don't think about it because because you get the you you get used to doing these sorts of things. The same thing here with with the cash journal. I started out doing it the same way. And pretty soon you don't have to do that anymore. Okay? Right? Okay. Questions? Oh, Sue? Um, I too have brought mine. Mine is still a work in progress. And I've discovered, remember I'm the 3 by 5 notebook girl? I found a 3 by 5 watercolor journal. So now, and we recently went to an antique show and they were selling these wonderful, they were, someone had taken 
ledger pages that had beautiful handwriting, and over that they do a drawing. So I thought, why can't I make my list, and then over my list of organisms, I put a drawing. So that's what I started to do. I'm, I'm good at points one and two that Michael talked about, an idea, a concept. I'm not very good at number three, getting it done on paper. So I have a big list because I'm kind of behind, but I'll put these out so people can see. And this is a finite number of pages. I like that. That's why these journals are good. If you buy a journal book and it's 500 pages in it, it's intimidating. You never finish it. That's why I buy ones that have 10 and 20 pages in it. Finish it. Right? You can finish it. Or, or else these you simply add to them and it's always finished. Where do you get the binder rings from Where do you get the binder rings? Uh, Rollabine. Oh, Rollabine. We get them off the internet. Yeah, they're like staples or something. The only thing is that you have to have the punch. Uh, the punch is over there, so. Yeah, that's what I use. Something else I've done, I made then another one. And I just used a whole punch and ring binders. And I haven't decided what I want for a cover yet. But again, it's watercolor paper. And I just punch the hole in it. So I'm making my own little booklet. That's another idea. OK, one final quote, then I'll let you take a break till 2.30. Till, uh, it says, materials are like elementary particles, charged, but indifferent. They do not listen in your fantasies. They do not get up and move in response to your idle wishes. The blunt truth is they do precisely what your hands make them do. The paint lays exactly where you put it. The words you wrote, not the ones you intended to write or needed to write or thought about writing, are the only ones that appear on the page. Okay? So it's important to learn techniques and skills that allow you to do what you want to do. Otherwise, it is so frustrating. Right? If you start on something before you're ready to do it, it's extremely frustrating. If you, if you do this sequentially, you will get to a point where you can, you can all do it. I've seen this a hundred times with people. They, they leap over here. There's one right there. Sue wanted to finish drawing, finish sketching before starting the process, did you? I only do pieces of things now. Well, she's found her niche. You know, it's, it's growing, so it's important to do that. So, yeah. <laughs> look at the journals, look at the handouts, come back at 2.30. Uh, many people have to nature likely to be the photographic image on TV, in a magazine, an exhibit, somewhere else. How many have ever ever seen Bengal tigers? I know more about Bengal tigers and cheetahs than I've ever. I've never seen one, but I know more about them because they're everywhere. There's images of them everywhere. Okay. The second thing is that. Unlike everything else that we've been talking about today, the camera is a technology of memory. The optimal word there being technology. It requires something else, some external uh, apparatus that the, everything we've done previously hasn't required, other than a pencil and a piece of paper and those sorts of things. So, Technology, and unfortunately, unfortunately, that's. I'm assuming all of you have some sort of visual technology for capturing images. You all have a camera, right? All of you have digital. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. I used to have to do both. You know, not so much anymore. We're going to talk about digital photography. We're going to. We're going to look at that photography, hopefully in a way that you've not thought about it before. We're going to, as Henry Cartier Brasson once wrote, shooting photographs is nothing more than accelerated drawing. What does that tell you? It tells you that when you take a photograph, who's in control of what it looks like? 
you are. That's the hardest concept I get across. Oh, I took this picture and it just didn't turn out the way I thought it would. Well, of course it didn't if you didn't tell it to do what you are supposed to do. So photography is about control. Okay? Control, control, control. The other thing I've took, I think you've all, your <laughs> eyes never take a bad picture. <laughs> right? What comes out is not necessarily what was inside of your brain. The same thing you talked about, you know, when you put the paint down, it stays where you put it. When you take an image, it only records what you told it to record because it is, unlike drawing and writing, it's pure physics. You, need to, you, need, you don't need to understand the physics, but you need to understand how to control certain things. And that's all that photography is about. Right. It's a series of problems that must be solved, right? which, which leads us to this little handout you've got. This is sort of the integration handout, and it's all, it calls solving problems. And it has five different depictions of the same scene in it. And each one of those presents a different set of problems that you need to solve. What I'd like you to do is look through those and just make a little list here on, as homework about what, what problems and what things you need to know to create those images. Okay? Integrated thinking, integrated learning, this is all about. That's very simple. I'm not going to go over that. The other thing on, I want to show you is this. You've got a set of handouts in here like this. There are 10, 10 of these. So there's five of them, one on each side. As far as I'm concerned, everything that you need to know about photography, the basics, is, is in those 10 handouts. So sometime between now and the end of the class period, you need to read each of those. There's not a lot of words in each one and understand them. And at each time, we're going to go over a couple of them, just, just for yucks to see if you're reading them. Okay? And that's not digital photography, that's not film photography, that's just pure things you need to know about photography. Anybody ever uh, studied the language? Anybody ever had to learn a different language? Okay, what's the process? You learn the words. You learn the grammar. You learn how to use them in a sentence. If you can't remember it, you look it up in your book, you know, and then you go talk to somebody in French, and all of a sudden they go, oh. You're like, what? Can you slow down a little bit? That's the way for... That's the way photography is learned, like a language, okay? It says, study French, for instance, and you'll likely spend the first month painstakingly translating it word for word into English to make it understandable. I took Russian in college. I had to literally translate it word for word in my head to understand it. That's what I was reading. When someone was speaking to me, oh, slow down, right? Then one day, all of a sudden, after about 30 hours, I could understand it without thinking about each word individually. You find yourself understanding and reading French without translating it. In a process that was previously enigmatic has become automatic. That's the way photography is. We're going to talk about f-stops, aperture, shutter speed, lighting techniques. And if you're in a field and you see an eagle flying by, and you're going to go, aperture, aperture, <laughs> right? 